All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Chris Hostetter. I work at Lucidworks. I work on solar. You are at ApacheCon Denver. Uh, this is my web page, this is my Twitter, this is my company. All the slides are up here if you want to find them. Um, this talk is on hidden gems in Apache Solar. Uh, what is a hidden gem? Uh, basically, I came up with this talk as a way, I kind of have a list that sort of accumulates and the order changes over time. It's stuff that uh, I know about that's in solar, stuff that uh, I'm occasionally surprised other people aren't aware of or they are aware of, but they don't realize how it affects them or how it's useful for them. Um, we're not gonna talk about bugs or anything like that. I'm also gonna try and avoid things that are particularly new because I did a talk yesterday on things that are new. These are, in a lot of cases, things that have been around for a long time, but not everybody appreciates how they can use them. Uh, because this is kind of a, a hodgepodge survey talk, uh, feel free to just kind of get my attention in the middle and ask a question, because uh, it is gonna you know, switch topics every couple minutes. So don't be shy about trying to wave your hand. Um, we have a mic for questions, but honestly, I told him let's not use it. Just shout out your question and I'll repeat it for the purpose of everybody else. Cool? Awesome. So we'll jump right in. First hidden gem. We'll start with a little softball, monitoring. Uh, this is the admin UI. Uh, who here has never, ever seen this admin UI before? This is my, this is my gauge, your familiarity with solar. So everybody, oh, you've never seen this before? You've seen it right here on this slide? That's it? Okay, all right. So this is the admin UI. Um, for the one guy in the back of the room who's never seen this before, you know, there's some navigation here. What we've done is I've drilled down and I've said, okay, in collection one, go give me some stats on my plugins. And then I've said narrow down to the cache type, and then I've drilled down into the filter cache, and here I've got some cache stats. Um, most people know about this. Let's start talking about the, the hidden gem part. Again, this is, this is a softball one. We're warming up with something simple. Um, you can't really see this because it's an image. Excuse me. I have the hiccups, which is a terrible thing to have right when you do a talk. Um, this says refresh values and watch changes. This is a handy little thing. The guy who did most of our UI work, Stefan Mathis, uh, an adorable German who lives in Zurich now. Uh, a fun little feature he added in here, particularly useful when you're in like development, is you can have, the admin UI is all JavaScript. Uh, it'll, it'll just sort of watch the stats while you're doing some stuff, and then you can say, tell me what changed. So it was a handy little quick way of saying like, uh, I'm pretty sure this should be a cache hit, but I don't want to have to remember what these numbers were when I switch tabs and then go do something and then come back and I should make sure that this number goes up and this number stays the same. Instead, you just hit watch changes, you go run your test queries, you come back, you hit the stop changes, and it'll tell you flat out your hit rate changed by this, your evictions changed by this, et cetera. So I, it's a handy little bit of uh, UI sugar it's uh, not a lot of people even realize what that does or what it's there for. Um, the other little hidden gem about this is all of these stats you see here, they're all available via JMX. So this is uh, JConsole. I think it's JConsole, I don't even remember. Um, but it's a handy little JMX client tool. If you're not familiar with JMX, it's sort of the standard um, Java monitoring. I don't know what the X stands for, but it's a, it's a standard sort of system. You can, there's a lot of, uh, JMX monitoring tools or JMX dashboards that you can point at Java applications. Solar exposes all of those stats that we were talking about before in here. So you can see I've drilled down into filter cache, all of the same exact stat information. So if you're using a monitoring system that knows how to talk to JMX systems, you can plug into that and you can have your, uh, your ops dashboard monitoring and looking directly at your solar stats to pay attention to things like your index size, uh, things like your cache hit rate, so you can sort of see like, oh shit, like the queries per second has spiked way up, and our cache hit rate has spiked way down. Maybe we're getting you know, hammered by a, a denial of service, or maybe a bot is crawling us with synthetic queries, things like that. If you, uh, if you don't like JMX, or your system can't speak JMX, it's also available, all that same data is available via REST API. So you can just go you know, hit a URL, get back some JSON with all those stats, do whatever you want with them in your client. This is actually how the admin UI works. Nothing is visible in the admin UI that you can't get from some REST API because the admin UI is 100% JavaScript single page app pulling those APIs and updating dynamically. Okay? So that's the first one that I'm always surprised people don't realize. Every now and then we get a question like, hey, is there any way programmatically to get this information? This like, it, yeah, it's right there. Um, any questions about that? 
Like I said, warming up with a softball here, something easy, something that uh, when stragglers come in, they won't have missed too much. All right, facet method. Who here has ever changed the facet method they use? One guy, one guy, two guys. You, uh, yeah, you have. That, yeah, all right, okay. <clears throat> so facet method. Facet method is a query parameter that you can pass 90% um, of the time. You don't have to worry about it. It has three different options. I want to explain what those three different options do, okay? Two of the options are called FC and FCS. What those stand for is filter cache or filter cache per segment, right? The default is to use the filter cache. What that does, if you were in my talk yesterday, it builds an uninverted index from the inverted index over the entire set of all documents. It makes it really fast for doing these lookups. It's a little slow to build that filter cache. Um, you know, every time your index changes, every time you open a new searcher, it has to do some work to generate that. But once it does, it does really fast lookups that make it really easy to do filtering or faceting on that field. Typical performance is that FC is a little faster than FCS for a lot of applications. Um, that's why it's the default. It's also kind of the older one. Where FCS is in theory a lot faster is when you're doing uh, near real time situations where you're doing a lot of open searchers very quickly because FCS doesn't have to rebuild the entire field filter cache. Filter cache. God damn, I cannot pick my words right today. It doesn't have to rebuild the entire field cache for the whole index every time you open a new searcher. It just has to do it for the new segments. Um, the normal caveat with talking about performance is your mileage may vary, your situation may vary, you should always test. I actually tried to do a synthetic test to demonstrate situations where FCS was faster than FC, and it was really, really hard to find one. <laughs> Even when I was like, oh, this is, a, this is a perfect example of a near real-time situation where I'm gonna like constantly be opening new searchers and I'm gonna be hammering it, and oh wait, on average, FC was still faster. You know, there were, I was still paying the hit on a lot of queries for that rebuild time, but even with that, I was really hard to get it to the point where my average changed. Um, but these are two you should definitely think about. The big caveat to both of these options, though, is these days doc values, which I talked a little bit about yesterday and what's new. Doc values are probably gonna be better. If you're using doc values, it, it doesn't matter which one of these you pick. It's still gonna use doc values instead of building the, uh, the field cache. But there is a third option, which not a lot of people know about, and that's the enum option. Enum is a weird one. Enum is actually the original faceting method in solar. When we first added faceting way, way back in the day, the enum algorithm was the one we used. And basically what it does, the reason it's called enum, is it walks the enumeration of every term in the field, and it generates a doc set for it, and then it intersects that with your result set. Um, it's not as fast in the typical case as using the FC or the FCS methods, but it has its perks, right? And the perks, the situations where it might make sense to use enum are, are pretty much the opposite ends of the spectrum. The first case where it might make sense to use enum is when you have fields with an extremely small cardinality. The, the basic example here is Boolean field. Boolean field in solar is the only one that defaults to the enum method by, you know, by default. Poorly crafted sentence. Um, and that's because building up the set of all documents where the value is true and the set of all documents where the value is false, that's very fast to do. It's just two sets it has to generate. And once it has them, they go in the, uh, in the filter cache. There it is. They go in the filter cache, just like if you then filtered on those facets, which a lot of people do. The smaller the cardinality, the more likely that's gonna be, to be a cache hit anyway in your application. So it can be really handy in that situation. Another example I gave to somebody recently where they found it was much faster was they had, um, they had a field, they were indexing like addresses and they had a state field and they wanted to facet on state. Well, there's only 50 states. If you count like Puerto Rico and DC, which I think he did, you know, he had like 55 discrete values. He found that for his data set, because of how many docs he had, he used a lot less memory by using the enum method on his state field than by letting the, uh, the normal FC method default. The other end of the spectrum is high cardinality fields. High cardinality fields are when you do things that everyone always tells you you shouldn't do, like try to facet on a full text field. Like I wanna facet on all of the words in all of the books in my index of all of the books in the Library of Congress. Um, the FC method and the FCS method, they're gonna use so much RAM, it'll never work. Uh, you'll, you'll basically max out your machine, you'll crash, OOM, end of story. With the ENU method, it'll work. It'll be slow as shit, but it'll work. People use this for particularly for things like building tag clouds or for doing some basic analytics where they're not worried about trying to do this on every request. 
This isn't something where someone interactively in their UI on every search, they're faceting on all the text, but they do it periodically. Um, it's got this additional option you can specify, which is called facet enum cache min df for min document frequency, which controls um, how big a set has to be for a term in order for it to decide to put it in the filter cache. The idea being that if you have a term that's only in like four docs, it's actually faster to go redo that next time than it is to go look it up in the cache. So we're only gonna cache the ones that have good, uh, a large volume of documents um, because then it's, more, then it's efficient to know these million documents match this term later on. But if only four documents match that term, we can go find those four documents just as fast as we can do a cache lookup. So these two situations are where it might make sense to think about using uh, facet method enum. All right, any questions about this so far, facet method? All right, quick show of hands, who learned something about facet method today that you didn't know before you got here? My life is complete. Result clustering, uh, another, well, I'm gonna be very redundant all day and I'm gonna say another hidden gem of Apache Solar that not enough people know about and I'm surprised by. Uh, Solar has what's called a clustering contrib. Um, the best way to explain what clustering contrib is for is to sort of refer to it as almost like dynamic faceting. This is a visualization that comes from the Carrot 2 guys. Really smart guys work over there. David Weiss, everybody in this room owes David Weiss a beer for his work on the test framework that Lucene and Solar uses. But he works on a project called Carrot 2, which is all about doing uh, document clustering. And they helped contribute a con uh, a contrib, uh, an optional plugin for solar that lets you do result clustering. This is an example if you did a search of you know, a, a bunch of web documents for tort, right? That's what I typed into his little demo, tort, and they created this little visualization. All of these labels are things they extracted out of the results of my document um, and de then decided were kind of statistically significant phrases in those results and then they sort of bucketed the documents based on that. So just based off the fact that I searched for tort and there was you know, 100,000 results, they look at the first, and I think like 100 or 200, and say, well, what common phrases do I find that seems significant in my result set? And it lets you build, uh, yeah, it's, it's configurable, but yeah, they looked at, I think, like the, uh, the summary section of the document or something. Um, how you use it in solar, that was, that's a nice little visual demo they do, but basically when you enable this clustering component and you configure it with what fields you want it to look at, then it just runs over your results and in addition to the normal document results you'll get, you'll get this clusters section back which will say, I found the following labels in the field you configured me to run on. These are labels I found that seemed significant and seemed worth considering a cluster. Um, this is the score of how confident I am that this cluster is meaningful and here are the documents that were in that cluster out of the first 100, 200, whatever you configured it to do in the result set. Um, like I say, this is, this is where the dynamic faceting label I think comes in handy because instead of you having to say upfront when you index your documents, this document is in the category environmental, this document is in the category human rights, you instead just give it the natural text and then later when you're getting your results back out, it tries to figure out what category labels it should maybe try to apply there. Yeah, question. Where does the label text come from? Are they imported? So the labels, yeah, the labels are coming from the body of the text. The question was where are we getting these labels? These are all things that the clustering algorithm has pulled out of whatever field you configured it to point at, right? So if you look at the example, um, example configuration for solar, there's an option where you can turn on clustering. You just point it at the clustering contrib jar, all the configuration for our example data is already in there, and it'll show you that. Um, there's also some pretty good documentation on how to turn this on. Excuse me, hiccups again. Um, and you, you'll sort of see how to, how to do that, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice little, it doesn't solve all the world's problems, but it solves a lot of interesting problems in a way people don't think about, right? And it, it's, it's very robust in how you can configure it. It's got under the hood, I don't remember the algorithms that it uses by default to find the clusters, but these are sort of classic machine learning problems in terms of how to find clusters in sample data sets. And you can actually configure different ones. You can tune the parameters on those machine learning algorithms. So there's a lot, there's, it's a lot of very powerful stuff you can do that most people think of as an offline batch processing, you know, Mahout type thing where I'm gonna crunch over my entire data set. This takes that problem and instead does it very efficiently at query time over just the, the matches that you got for a single query or just the first 
100 or 200 matches that you got for a single query to try and find you and recommend you some moderate results. Yeah. So the, the question was how much extra time does this add to processing? I do not. I am, I am not an expert on this. I just bring it up as something that even I, this is, this is the gem even I forget a lot. When people like start talking about problems, like sometimes I'm like, oh wait, clustering. Like I forgot, you could, clustering might help here. Um, it's not something I personally have a lot of hands on with. It is not, it is not super slow, I can tell you that much. Um, it, is, it is relatively efficient. Tim, do you have? Yeah. Yeah, it's because, and, and part of that is because, I mean, when people usually talk about these kinds of algorithms being slow, they're talking about it on a full uh, corpus analysis, right? But the whole point here is it's optimized for the fact that it's running on a small number of documents, relatively small number of documents. You know, if you have a million docs in your corpus and 500,000 match your query, it's still only doing the analysis on the top, you know, 100 or 200 scoring documents and finding the labels based on those. Yeah. So the question is, is this new or is this a recent con contribution? Carrot 2 has been around a long time. The clustering component in solar has actually been around for several years. Um, but Carrot 2 is also, yeah, they're definitely improving stuff over time. And I mean, Carrot 2 is a company and a project. You know, they have uh, a commercial version that's probably more efficient and does better, smarter stuff. But the open source one that's free and is, I'm pretty sure, Apache licensed or it's Apache licensed compatible BSD. Oh, what? Okay, so, so the comment was the license used to be LGPL, so you had to install it manually, but now the license has changed, so it's more friendly. Um, yeah? Is this still contrib and what is that all about? It is still contrib. For people who aren't familiar when I say contrib, that's a, that means it's an optional uh, add-on that you can use. It is not baked into solar. It's not a hard-coded part of the application. You can figure in your uh, solar config.xml to say, Here's a jar, go get it. When we say it's a contrib, though, we mean it actually still ships with solar. Um, in this case, I think the comment before about the licensing, the jars you needed to put into solar had dependencies which you had to go manually get yourself. That's what kind of changed. But it's still not there by default. You have to turn it on, you have to enable it. It's a plugin we ship, but it's still a plugin. Does that make sense, folks? Okay. So the, the phrase Jack just asked me, and I'm thinking about it, is it's a core part of solar, but it's not in the core. I would say it is a piece of code that the Lucene Solar Project maintains and releases, but it is not enabled by default or embedded in the application. It is you optionally load that code. So, okay. Next thing I want to talk about. Function boosting and personalized scoring. Uh, this is basically two things, but they're very related and they're going to build off each other. So. The first thing is I wanna show these two examples here of boosting functions. Um, the first one is the one that most people may be familiar with, which is that you have a query for something, um, Nightfall, Isaac Asimov. You're using the eDismax parser, uh, which lets you query over many fields. I'm not showing all the options here. And then you're taking advantage of some built-in some boosting support in the eDismax parser to say I wanna boost by popularity divided by price. Um, and we're, we're adding one to the price so we don't get divided by zero if it's a free product. Um, is this something people are generally familiar with, the syntax? Is anybody surprised by this? You, you are familiar, I assume. Yeah, okay, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, that's good. Amin knows me, he knows that I ask positive questions, not negative questions. Everybody who is familiar with this, please raise your hand. All right, cool. So is everybody familiar with this second example where I'm not using eDismax, I am using the boost query parser? Same, same hands, I'm guessing? Right, okay. So this is a very simple example of function boosting where I am boosting by my domain knowledge. I am saying I know that for my domain, the field popularity, the bigger that number is, the better, in general, in the abstract. And I know that for my users, they generally like the cheap shit. So if my users wanna buy Nightfall by Isaac Asimov, they probably wanna buy the more popular additions, or in general, this is gonna match other things, but the really popular stuff is the stuff they're more likely to buy, and the stuff that's cheaper, they're more likely to buy. So I will boost those kind of independently. Um, again, this is something new solar users, it doesn't always occur to them they could do this. We tend to get questions where it's like, oh, how do I tune 
the similarity mechanism and the TF-IDF scoring to know about the fact, you know, I'm actually, I'm, I'm phrasing the question poorly. Typically the way the question starts is, I'm getting bad results. Why isn't it giving me the good results? I want the good results. Where are the good results? And it's like, well, what do you mean good results? It's like, well, obviously this is the good result. And then they just give you like a number. You know, it's like obviously product 47 is the good one. Why isn't product 47 on top? And then you have to go back. It's like, well, why is product 47 the good one? It's like, well, duh, it's the one with the highest rating. It's like, aha, now we know something about your schema. Now we know that you have a rating field and that bigger is better in your rating field. Let's use that. Let's, can, let's think about the functions that you want to apply to augment the sort of natural language relevancy metric, TF-IDF, BM25, whatever you might be using for the text portion of your query, let's augment that with a mathematical function on what you know about the numeric qualities of your query, right? Not a lot of people, first couple times they use solar, does this really occur to them? But it's ma massively powerful, right? Do not underestimate it. Uh, if you go look at my webpage, I had a talk in Germany two years ago on called Boosting and Biasing, where I just go on this for like an hour, and there's a video, go watch it. Um, but this is, oh yeah, sorry, Bill. The second one, you have the plus title. Is that needed on every field or not needed? Okay, so what Bill was asking me is in this second example here where I've got plus title nightfall followed by author Isaac Asimov. This is just, I, I did a slightly different query and this was just kind of to show that I was using the Lucene query parser. This plus is just saying that uh, title nightfall is mandatory. I'm only allowed documents that match that. Optionally, documents can match author Isaac Asimov, but I don't want all books by Isaac Asimov. I only want all books with the nightfall in the name, if they're by Isaac Asimov, even better. Right, that, that's the syntax there. You don't, I mean, you don't have to do it, I just chose to do it. With EDIS Max, it tends to be less common. You're, you're doing more, it's just different syntax, two different examples, so. Okay, so this was, like I said, this was basic function boosting. Let's talk about personalized scoring. Uh, there's a gentleman uh, sitting over there working on his laptop, uh, Amit, uh, Amit N. I'm not gonna try and say his last name because I don't know it and he's told me two different things over the years, so I'm not gonna pretend I understand. Um, Amit has done some really cool stuff in the past and he saw my boosting and biasing talk and in my boosting and biasing talk I was like, hey, here's a really cool idea. I'd love to see people do it in practice and Amit took me seriously. So Amit has started looking into some really interesting stuff and he's got a talk in like two hours or two blocks or whatever. Uh, you should totally check out his talk, I plan to, where he talks about some of his experiences, including some stuff like this. I'm not gonna like, you know, harsh his buzz or whatever about, you know, what he's working on, but this is an example of something that came up on the solar user mailing list that he was working on, which is um, to accumulate data on his users, accumulate what their interests are, you know, batch process those into some normalized scores of what categories they're interested in, not just like they really like this document, but they seem to like documents in these categories, and sort of distill it down to a basic formula where he's gonna, anytime his users come back, he's gonna search on whatever they search on, but he's gonna boost it on a basic function where he multiplies that by um, some, some, some I, I hate to use the word boosting functions again, but basically he's going to compute some scores for each of those documents based on how well they match categories that that user has indicated they have a strong opinion about. It may be a positive opinion or it may be a negative opinion, but we've computed some normalized information to know that for a given user, they seem to really like action movies, they seem to really like comedies, and they seem to really hate kids movies, right? That's what we know about Bill. So we're gonna take that information that we have computed offline about Bill and the next time Bill comes to our site, we're gonna look him up, we're gonna look up in our you know, user authentication system what his three preferences are, and we're gonna use them as variables into this equation. Right? Really interesting idea, and I'm hoping Ahmed is planning on going into more depth so I don't have to right now, right? Us, so go to Ahmed's talk, because this is really badass shit in my opinion. Any questions about this that Ahmed will not answer later? I doubt it, right, right? Okay, good. <coughs> Woo, <coughs> sorry about that. So defaults, appends, and variants, oh my, lions and tigers and bears. Um, one of the complaints people sometimes have about solar, and I'm gonna try not to sound like this is ridiculous, is that there are a lot of options when you make a solar request, and those options make your URLs very long, and they're ugly, and they're hard to read. And I don't think anybody looking at this URL can at a quick glance tell me what it's doing, and I don't blame you, because while this is handy if you know what you're doing and you're typing it out, once you're done typing it out, you probably already forgot what's in the middle of it, which is why in production, 
I wouldn't ever suggest that anybody constantly be sending URLs like this to solar. Um, configuration makes your life easier. That URL we just saw, everything that was in there, 90% of that is stuff that you're never gonna change per request. So if you're never gonna change it per request, configure it as a default on your request handler and let the client send in the very simple things that do change on every request. So this is an example where I've said, hey, once you've, in your development, figured out what you want your configuration to be for your request, once you've figured out that these are the query fields you want, and this is the boost you want, and this is your default sort, put those into your defaults for your request handler. You can have many request handlers, you can have different configurations for different clients or for different use cases, but there's no reason why you need to have a one meg URL that doesn't change over and over again going over the wire, okay? So that's defaults. So, what's that? Okay, so the comment was that when you have lots and lots of request handlers, it may be hard to manage. That is a problem that I don't personally think is, I think we have a lot of other problems we should tackle first, but he's suggesting that a GUI for managing this stuff would be convenient. Um, yeah, that's true. I, I was just thinking about your patch that you mentioned. Uh, Amit, Amit was trying to convince us that we should do JMX management of this a while ago. Um, but I digress. Yes, yeah, sorry, you had another question? To what? Yeah, yeah, I'll get to that in just a second. So uh, I'm not gonna repeat that question because I'm gonna talk about it in another slide. Um, but so the point here is really defaults. It's taking things that you want as defaults out of your URL, putting them in configuration is handy. Defaults are not all you can do. Uh, you can also take advantage of what's called invariance and appends. So if we read this bottom to top, what this says is I have two parameters that I want to default. The client can still override these. My default start is at zero, but if the client wants page two, they can pass a different one. My default list of fields are these four, but if the client wants different fields, they can set them. Appends is slightly different. Appends means that for multi-value parameters, like filter query, even if the user or the client gives me filter, additional filter queries, I always want this one. And this is where I'm preventing, this, this is, is maybe a security issue, or maybe it's just a common sense thing. I have products in my index, for business reasons, I have all of my products in my index, even the ones that aren't available. Even if they are not in stock, I have them in the index, maybe so a tool can search them. But my front end clients, I never want them to see products that aren't in stock. So I have a filter query, in stock true, which is always there. And no matter what kind of faceting or other filtering my front end does, I want that parameter always applied. The last example are the invariants. Those are things that no matter what the client does, these won't change. The client can't send me a boost and have it be respected or used or appended to, no, fuck it. This is the boost, this is what they get, it always happens. And this can be used, like I say, it can prevent client mistakes, you can think of it as like a, a very simple sort of access control. And in the end, you can say, this is your handler, I'm gonna tell you to use select, I'm gonna tell somebody else to use something else, but you use your handler to access the stuff I want you to access, and here is what I have given you as the baseline here is what you were allowed to change. Um, it can also hide implementation details. This is an example where I'm taking advantage of something called the switch queue parser, uh, which is a little new, but it wasn't important enough for me to mention in my other talk. Basically, it implements like a switch case statement as a query parser. Um, so in this example, I've told my, my clients, the parameters you can pass me are shipping and cat. Cat is a category name, and you're looking at this going, that is not a supported Solar option. Likewise, shipping, they're passing the value free to members. Again, not a, what is this? This doesn't look familiar. Well, what I'm doing here is I'm saying I'm gonna have two filter queries, which are case statements based on shipping and cat. For cat, if, uh, if I get the value of any, I'm gonna turn this whole filter query into a star colon star, meaning I ignore it, I don't apply any category filters. But by default, whatever other value I get in cat, I'm gonna go use this cat filter parameter and I'm gonna do a term query on it in a particular category field. For the, uh, for the shipping value, it's a little different. I say whatever my shipping value is, if it's any, that's again a star colon star, no filtering. If it says free to members, well then I'm gonna use a filter query. Remember, that's the whole context of this is a filter query. I'm gonna generate a filter query on some field called member shipping, where the member shipping has to be zero dollars. 
If it says just free, then I'm going to do a filter query on the shipping field where it has to be zero dollars. Because I don't have a default here, any other value, Solar will throw an error that it doesn't that the that the shipping is illegal. Okay. But this is where I'm taking advantage of appends. I'm taking advantage of defaults to say, you know, category any, shipping any. I'm bundling all this in my config to create a, a very simple solar URL where I'm hiding the implementation details. My, my end users have no idea how I'm implementing shipping. Maybe later I turn that into a Boolean field. Or maybe later I turn category into a numeric field. It doesn't affect them. I'm trying to hide those details as much as possible. Right? Does that make sense to folks? Okay, the switch query parser, uh, if you look at these slides, there's links in the notes to all this stuff, so you can go find the docs on this. I, I'm pretty proud of the switch query parser as kind of a nice little tool that's in your toolkit that you can use. It, don't get me wrong, it's not a silver bullet. It won't let you build complex REST APIs in solar. But for things like this, where you want like custom filter queries based on sets of values, it can be really handy. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is hierarchical documents, aka block join. This is something I thought about talking about yesterday and what's new, but it just didn't make the cut, so it's here instead. Um, we, we talk about hierarchical documents. The classic use case for this in information retrieval and in documents is dealing with things like books, which contain chapters, which contain pages, and you want to be able to support searches on things like find me the pages in the books that match this word, but you also want to be able to find you know, books that contain pages that match this word or books, or find me pages which can match these words which are in books by this author, things like that. Um, sorry, I'm just doing a quick time check here. So, so nested documents, this is what an example might look like uh, in XML. Um, as of Solar 4.7, XML and the Solar J API was the only way you could do this. As of 4.8, you'll be able to do it in JSON too. But for now, it's in 4.7, it's XML. But you see, I'm adding one document. The document has some fields. It's got its ID. I'm going to have a doc type field for album, just to keep straight my album versus my songs. The album has a name, and it contains child documents one per song. They still have to have an ID. I'm going to still give them a doc type just for my own sanity so I can filter on things. But then they have a song name and an artist name. When I've indexed these documents, I can do queries like find me all of the soundtracks. Just, you know, this is a regular solar query, which you might expect. I'm filtering by doc type, querying for soundtrack in the name. Um, I can query for songs. Again, a normal query. Songs are regular documents, even though they're nested under the albums. You can still do regular queries for them just like you're used to. But where things get interesting is when you start taking advantage of either the parent query parser or the child query parser. So here, I have a query for soundtrack. Um, ideally, I didn't, you know, I tried to keep this example short, but ideally I should be filtering on doc type album. But then I'm also filtering and saying, I only want documents which are a parent of things that match love. And again, I'm, I'm shortened this URL. It should be ideally the song name love. The only thing that's interesting about this parent guy, or the only thing that's not obvious, is because there can be multiple levels in hierarchical documents, you have to pass in some information about how to identify which level you're interested in. In this case, I just have albums and songs. So this is pretty much always going to be doc type album. It defines what the parent-child relationship is. But if I had multiple levels, if I had books containing chapters, containing pages, then when I say I want parents of something, I have to define at what level I want those parents to be, right? You can flip the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, we'll, co we'll come back to Jack's question in a minute, but good question, Jack. So, um, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, how, so the question is about, like, their individual documents. From a solar perspective, they're individual documents that happen to have either a parent or a child nested in them or out of them. How you use that to model a real world thing and how you want the metadata in those documents to map to something you're going to do then if you want to drill down and click over to a real world web page or to a real world book metadata, I mean, that's up to you. That's, you know, that's no different than it always is. What matters is that from solar standpoint, you index it as a thing, right? You index the parent with all of its children in it. You can query for the parents by themselves, just like a regular solo query. You can ch query for the children by themselves, just like a regular solo query. It only gets interesting when you want to start layering data, right? Where you want to start saying, I want parent documents 
of children that match something, or when you say, I want children that match love and are children of parents that match soundtrack, right? That's the only, that's where it starts to get interesting and you have to use these, these special new parsers. Child can't have two parents because when you index the child, right it has to be inside the parent. Where, 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 where you can have is, like I said, you can have a complex hierarchy. So um, I picked a poor example by using albums and songs, but you can imagine if we go back to the book example, the child of pages can have a parent, which is a chapter, but it can have a parent, which is a volume, right? And that's where, that's where this, uh, this parser and its embedded filter is important. Because that says, you know, in this case, let me go to the, the better example. In this case, I am looking for songs. I am looking for the leaf level child, but I want to constrain them based on a property of the parent. Well, how high up in the hierarchy am I looking for? What, what am I defining as parent? Is it, is, it the, is it the chapter? Is it the section? Is it the volume? This is what tells me. It tells me that at the level of album, I want to apply this criteria. Right? And there could be multiple levels in that hierarchy, but that's how you control that. All right? So if we go back and think about for a minute those defaults and invariants in the switch queue parser, we can hide a lot of those details again. Right? These are four examples. This is, imagine I set up a handler called songs. This URL, the way this is configured, I won't drill into it because this is more understanding of the switch parser again and all that. But this would give me every song in my index, regardless of what album it's on. This would give me every song whose name matched love. This would give me every song who was in an album whose name matched soundtrack. And this would give me every song where the song name matched love and the album matched soundtrack. Um, and like I say, it's, you do have to understand some solar stuff to be able to read this. So, you know, if you tried to show this to your mother or your grandmother, they'd be like, this is gibberish. I don't know what it is. But once you've used solar for a little while, this isn't that hard to follow. Right? I mean, this is this, you know, once you know what the switch Q parser does, once you understand local params, and by the way, these slides have links where you can learn all about those if you don't and you're shy. Um, this is a pretty straightforward way to configure a very basic interface to let you do some really powerful stuff. Okay? So Jack brought up a question before about block joining and the indexing and things. There are some caveats to block joins. It's relatively new. This is the parent issue where you can see some of the, you know, still pending kind of issues hanging off of it. Um, but there are a lot of caveats. Um, the, it's currently only done as a constant scoring query, which is why in most of my examples I use it as a filter. This, as far as I remember, is just an implementation detail. We just haven't added the option to make it scoring. Um, but I think that's all built in already in the code. You do have to have a special root field, which is needed at your top level document. Um, and it's important for being able to delete things. As Jack brought up, um, when this is indexed under the covers, the children all have to be there as part of the parent. And if you want to update either the parent or any of the children, you have to re-index the whole thing, right? Where we get into some issues is right now is that if you don't do that, if you don't remember that you have to do that, um, you can get some weird non-deterministic behavior right now, um, some of these bugs here. Um, also, some coming soon, I, we actually, I'm pretty sure I committed this, so this will be in 4.8. No, no, I didn't commit this yet. We're still working on this. The ability to get metadata about your children or about your parent in the response. Right now, it's just a filtering option. We're trying to get to the point where you could say, like, find me all the children of albums that match soundtrack, and I want to know the soundtrack name for each of those children. That's not currently possible, but we're trying to get there. Any other questions about blockchain? And did this answer your question, Jack? All right, I just want to double check. Any other questions about blockchain? Yeah, Steve. Hmm. That's a good question. So Steve just asked me how it works with distributed solar and solar cloud. It works just as well as anything else. Because when you index it, what matters in terms of the shard it goes to is the parent doc. So the parent doc, all the children, they all come along with it. So you don't have to worry about the children winding up on a different shard and not being available when it tries to do that query. They all come along with the parent. They go to the right shard. But this is, again, like I mentioned, there's some caveats about deleting and updating. You have to be very careful right now, like delete by ID on the parent doesn't work. It has some flukes. Um, if you, I, I, there was a comment somebody posted, they got really confused. They were trying to, they were trying to do parent child stuff where what they had was, I don't know their specific data model, but basically you can imagine it like, first I indexed all my songs, because some songs aren't on albums, and then later an album was released that had that song on it. 
And so when I added the album, I expected it to go delete the song because it has the same unique key, but it didn't work for that way because we view this whole thing as one block, right? And so we weren't looking, you know, Solar doesn't look down the nested tree of hierarchies and go make sure it deletes all those even if they're under other parents right now. So that's why I say there are some caveats, but for, for a lot of things, it works really handy. One of, the, one of the use cases of this that I think is really powerful is where your sort of child docs aren't things you would normally think of as documents, but are things that you would think of as multi-valued metadata. So like authors, um, you, you can imagine a document, which is this is a book, and I'm gonna have subchilds, which are the authors of my book, and those subchild documents will have first name and last name. So I can say, find me books written by people named Bob Smith. You don't have to worry about one of the author's first name was Bob and the other author's last name was Smith. It'll actually find you both guys, Bob and Smith. Or, sorry, it'll find you books where only one guy really does have the name Bob and Smith. Artem? What about the speed? Uh, I can uh, add two documents with the same parent fields, and I think it will be faster. Okay, right, so Artem's, Artem's asking about the performance of this versus just flattening and denormalizing your data. If you can flatten and denormalize your data, that is probably faster in a lot of cases, but that, that doesn't necessarily help you, for example, with that case I was just giving of you really want to be able to filter on specific properties of the subchild documents. Um, you know, the example like you were talking about where you flatten and denormalize, if I flatten and denormalized my authors and I really wanted to track first name and last name metadata separately, once you flatten that information into the book documents, there's really no way to, to filter and say, find me a book where an author has the same first name and last name as my query, right? You, you would get, it would get confused. This goes back, I mean, Robert sort of talked about this with his Three Wolf Moon example of, I want a small shirt and I want it to be blue. You know, if you don't do this kind of structure, it's very hard to get that query right to find, you know, where the shirt is available in a small and blue. You might find one where it's available in small green and it's available in large blue, but you want both criteria to apply. This really helps in that situation. Right, right. Right, yeah, if you flatten it, it's very hard to distinguish between those two because they sort of wind up in the same field. You know, like all of the colors wind up in a single multi-valued color field, and all of the sizes wind up in a single-valued size field, and it's hard to filter and say, I want to really know. Right, right, yeah, that's, I mean, that's where this, this uh, the question was you won't necessarily know that parent information yet until we finish this issue. You, you can know that parent information if you redundantly index it in the child, so it's, you kind of have to do both. You get the benefit of the filtering, but if you want that metadata, that metadata does have to be redundant. That's true. Yeah. Um, but that's where I say, that's where this issue, this solar 5285, if we can resolve that, a lot of that headache goes away. Okay. Uh, yes. What, one more question. So the question was about doing block join documents with DIH. I don't believe... I don't believe anything in DAH right now natively does it. I don't think there's like a built-in automatic way to do it when you're pulling, because like DAH already has the concept of entities and sub-entities. I don't think there's any magic hook to just say do the sub-entities as child documents. That would be a good thing if somebody wanted to work on to add that. If you have a custom, I mean, you can do it, all of the internal plumbing is there so that when you're dealing with SolarJ and you're dealing with the solar document class or the solar input document class, it's all there to work. So a custom DAH uh, plugin absolutely could do it. DIH can certainly do it as soon as somebody writes the code. There's nothing to stop that. Um, it'd be fairly straightforward, but I don't think anybody's actually implemented that yet. Because um, it's, it's hard to know, like, you don't just want to assume from the sub-entity that you're going to do it, you know? Okay, so I have, I think, only one more, maybe two, and we're running out of time, so I want to just jump ahead. Um, update processors. Uh, this is a really powerful feature solar that not a lot of people know about, largely because it's not documented very well. But... Basically, every update request that comes through Solar goes through a pipeline. There's a default pipeline, which is very simple. You can add additional, you can either make it more interesting or you can add additional named pipelines and funnel certain updates from certain clients into certain pipelines. Here's a quick example. Um, you know, you can, I should say, you can write update processors that do anything you want. Solar provides you a nice toolkit of very simple update processors that can be chained together. This is an example of using a handful of those. 
if we imagine again our books example, if I just had a large multi-valued field of authors and a large multi-valued field of editors, and I said once I have my documents in my index, I really want two additional fields. I want a contributors field, which is a single string listing all of the authors and editors, and I also want a primary author field, which is whatever author comes first. This is a simple little pipeline that does that. Um, I have a clone field processor that's going to clone from these two fields into one. So when I'm done with this processor, now contributors is multi-valued and has all the strings. I have a concat processor that I'll run on contributors to join them all together with a semicolon. I have an, I'm going to use the clone again. I'm going to take all of my authors and move them into a primary author field. At this point, it's a list, multiple values. And then I'm going to use the first one to say chop everything off but the first guy. Right? So this is an easy way with configuration, no code, and more importantly, not having to modify my client who's sending me my data, which I may not be in total control over. I can then on server side configure some simple processors to clean that up. Okay? So uh, there's a handful of examples. There were some other examples I talked about yesterday in terms of schema list. There's also a, a scripting one. If you know JavaScript, you can write a little script to do some stuff, and you can plug that in using the script engine support. Um, Pretty powerful, pretty straightforward, pretty easy to use. That was all I had. We still do have a few, we have three minutes for questions. I think I got most of the questions as we were going. Does anybody have any questions about the update processor stuff? Uh, excuse me. Oh. Can, can you? Ah, all right. Artem really wants you to use the mic. Um, could you potentially use the, could you potentially use the um, result clustering to maybe drive uh, an audited list of like the taxonomy updates? Trying to identify. I'm not sure what you mean by you used updates. I was with you until you said updates at the end of that sentence. Well, so like if you have a, a specific taxonomy that changes dynamically because it's maybe a schema that's kind of uh, an area of a business that's constantly changing, adding new terms, could you use basically the knowledge that's already out there to drive right. basically updating that file so that you could then use those in, in your searches in a yeah, much more efficient way than dynamically? Um, I think, I mean, you, you could, but I think that's. Uh, a hammer to drive a screw kind of question. Um, the same algorithms could be used, but I would do them in more of a batch processing map reduce style job where offline I'm saying my data, you know, like, like once a month I'm going to run cluster analysis across my entire corpus. The, the, the result clustering component, I mean, note the name specifically is result clustering, right? It's clustering on the subset of results that you get back for a query. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Right, the same algorithms can be used in batch and those tools can be used in batch. I would not necessarily try to shoehorn this component for that. This is really more about for a single query because, it, because it, you know, even if you do that batch processing and you really find good clusters in your, result, in your corpus as a whole, that doesn't mean that those clusters are necessarily helpful to someone who does one query and wants to partition it. What this is really handy for is no matter how niche your query is, whatever results you get back, it'll suggest ways to partition it even further. Okay, Bill. Yeah, we started using payloads a lot, um, and the support is you know you have to write like a module for similarity um, uh -huh. a, a component, and I was wondering if we're going to be moving more in a direction like we did for um, the update um, pipeline to do you know pre-built components that people can just start using without having to build their own similarity algorithms. Right. Um, I don't know of any plans to that. I don't personally have any plans to that. Part of, the question was about payloads, which I didn't talk about. And if you're not too familiar with payloads, it's a way of adding metadata to individual term occurrences in documents, which can then be used in a plethora of ways. And part of the issue is it can be used in so many ways, and it's so diverse in like, what you might want to do with it that nobody's really come up with a generalized solution, which is why out of the box there's very little support for doing any one thing with it. There's a lot of support for doing whatever you want with it. But it involves, like you say, writing a lot of custom code. You have to deal with the payloads at index time. You have to deal with the payloads at similarity. You have to decide what those payloads mean. You have to encode whatever significant metadata you want into a byte field or into a byte binary. And then you have to decode it when you want to use it. I mean, it's definitely complicated. I, I, I would totally be receptive if people said, here is a set of update processors and similarities that work well together, that if you drop this update processor in and you drop this similarity in, boom, this happens. Um, I think we could certainly use more of those. It's just hard to have general. The use cases for payloads tend to be so domain specific in my experience that it's hard to have a general one, right? Most of the cases where like here's a super general example of why it would be useful, you could almost do with functions just as easily. So it's hard to find those like, no, I really will need payload for this and it's a general purpose, right? So I think we're out of time. Thank, Thank you, you all Chris. for coming.
Uh, well, the next talk is in 10 minutes, and I believe it is, nope, I'm it's in two hours. Test Who's next? driven. Who's next? Relevancy. Test driven relevancy. Oh, that's right, relevancy driven test development. So yeah, you guys should all stick around for that talk. Thank you very much.